And Ted, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Really appreciate you spending some time with us. My pleasure. So let's start. Um, so what I know about you from a little bit of research is you are a Brooklynite with immigrant roots, with working class roots. How do you, do you still bring that filter to work with you every day and, and lead the organizations that you lead? Um, very much so. I think that um, you can't shake your past and um, your roots are what uh, centers you. And so I grew up in a, um, in a community where no one went to college. Everyone was, um, was blue collar and um, it was a very um, diverse community. And so every thing that I've done in my life and career has been reflective of that. And I've always tried to hold the mirror up to the people that we serve. And it's wonderful just to look out and see um, this group of leaders and I see a lot of women, I see a lot of people of color and uh, different age groups and that's more and more of what makes for good business. It's not just the right thing to do, but creating um, businesses that have higher callings and serve the people is I think um, the smartest way to build value and also be able to uh, look in the mirror and be proud of what you built. And so early on, folks like, uh, I think uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Jim Shannon that you mowed the grass for, uh, who saw some things in you. But there were other people who maybe didn't see the same things, like high school guidance counselors and such. Jeez, you've done research. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. So okay. my, my dad didn't finish high school and um, went into the service and um, they, we lived in Brooklyn and my neighborhood was getting uh, riddled with drugs and crime and so we moved to Massachusetts and to where my mom and dad grew up, Lowell, Massachusetts, which was a mill town and there's a, a high school there, Lowell High School and the Lowells were a family, a very Brahmin family that essentially created a, a city where immigrants, they would bring in immigrant labor and frankly, pre-OSHA, my, my grandfather worked in a, a mill and died like nine months after he came from just breathing in the, the toxins and, um, and, and they created Lowell High School, one of the oldest high schools. And, and it was very, very uh, broken into, I would say, the, the Brahmins, the Wasps, and everyone else. And, the uh, guidance counselor, I'll never forget, you'll never forget and love this name. Her name was Beatrice Hoare. <laughs> wow. Can't make that up, right? H O A R. Be a whore. <laughs> wow. God rest her soul. Wow. And, and, and I, I was in a special progress class in. In New York, I, I went to uh, kindergarten early. I skipped the eighth grade. I was a, uh, a good student. And then we moved, and they didn't know who I was, and I became a part of these statistics. And Beatrice told my parents that I was not college material, mm -hmm. and that it would be best if I, uh, I sought a career um, in the produce department of a grocery store that I have been working in. And, um, and that really motivated me to fight the power. Say, I don't know who Beatrice Hoare is, but um, <laughs> she's, she's not right and I will show them. And I think that's a big part of immigrant America, you know, we're the greatest startup nation to be able to say, I'll show you. Mm -hmm. And um, so you mentioned Jim Shannon, and, and that was my, my first, um, wasn't really a mentor, but it was the first uh, signal to me that a little bit of, of effort and kindness by somebody can truly change your life. Um, um, I didn't have any money, it was the summertime, I needed to try to find a way to make a little bit of money to save for college. And, um, 
And so I now, we lived in Lowell, Massachusetts, and there were these homes that had big lawns. Brooklyn, New York, there were no lawns. <laughs> so I went to the library, and I, I found a book, Black and White Pictures, How to Mow Lawns. <laughs> wow. Landscaping. And so I went knocking on people's doors and said, I need a job for the summer. I'd like to mow your lawn. And this one guy answered the door, and he said, you ever mowed a lawn? Got any equipment? I said, no, but here's this book. And <laughs> <laughs> which cut do you like? And he laughed, and he said, OK, I'll give you a shot. There's my, my stuff. Go and do it. And I spent like nine hours cutting this guy's lawn. And I was fastidious. I mean, I was on my knees with a scissor. <laughs> And he was looking out the window, and he said, OK, you got a job. And so every weekend, I mowed his lawn. And at the end of the summer, he said, you thinking of school? You thinking of college? And to be honest, I, I wasn't, because there was no peer group around me that were going to college. And Beatrice Ford told me I wasn't college material. And uh, he said, oh, I went to Georgetown. And um, Next week, I'll bring you the information. And so I filled out the application, and he wrote a letter for me. And I was accepted. Georgetown was not a need-blind university at the time. I had to borrow a lot of money and had ended up with lots of jobs while I was here. And the first time I ever saw Georgetown University in the campus was the day I showed up. I took a Greyhound bus from Lowell to New York Avenue, and, wow. um, and so if I don't go to the library, get the book, and Jim Shannon doesn't say, um, sure, mow my lawn, and doesn't look out the window to watch me on my knees cutting the grass, I'm not in Washington, D.C., I don't own the teams. Uh, so it's, it's truly remarkable how um, just a little bit of kindness for people, a little bit of caring can really change the arc and narrative of families and the like, and I've taken that seriously. So did you ever get to go back and show Miss Hoare? You know, to be <laughs> honest, I was uh, the Lowell, Massachusetts Alumni Hall of Fame entrant. Uh, <laughs> Jack Kerouac and I were like uh, wow. Paul Saunders. Wow. And, um, and um, I gave a speech. Actually, I got there early, and I asked to see my, my grades. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, my speech was that uh, C students ruled the world. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, no, I, I don't think that she remembered or, or knew what was happening. Got it. Got it. You talk about kindness being a really important piece of your story. And we live in a time where there's not as much kindness out there as maybe there could be. Um, how do you kind of instill that in your organization? Like it has to go all the way to the bottom and obviously you have to lead that. How do you get that down to the bottom? Um, well, empathy is the um, human emotion that's um, most underrated, I, I believe. Um, Although, collectively, we really value empathy. Um, you know, the last monument that was put on the mall was for Martin Luther King. And he was the most empathetic of our leaders. Um, our most popular recent president, President Obama, was a community organizer and had lots of personal empathy. Um, sometimes you can over-index on empathy, and you know, when a pendulum goes this way, you end up swinging the other way. But I believe in human emotions and being able to tap into uh, what people want collectively. And I think people want good listeners. I think people uh, want to believe in the innate goodness of people. And that if you can tap into um, higher callings, that you can get people to rally around things. And so 
I try to practice my empathy. Um, and I think curiosity is something that is a part of empathy. And someone mentioned to me outside, they said, oh, I just went to a go-go game. I, I went to the new arena in St. Elizabeth's. And I said, I, I thank you for that. Because I can't tell you how many people have written about Ward 8 and St. E's and opined on it and never been there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a complete lack of empathy, a complete lack of, um, of I would say, um, the white elite blogger media uh, mentality where you rage with pixels, but you don't do the work. Mm. And, um, and so I, I've spent a lot of time in Ward 8. It's a community that deserves our, our help, but not our pity. It's, their, they, it's a startup, a restart community is what I would say. And so we want to um, be good neighbors. We want to help there. But there's a lot of dots that we need to connect. Um, someone else earlier today who's an architect, will you raise your hand, whoever um, came to me and s heard me give a, um, a spiel about um, why change and disruption is so hard. And we have this pending issue coming where Washington, D.C. has run out of land. This building is a beautiful building that we're in, uh, but we've run out of land, mostly because of our height restrictions in the city. And so where will we grow? Well, the growth is happening in Virginia and Maryland, but in D.C. it's going to be on the other side of the Anacostia. And we will have issues about reclaiming that real estate and it'll be developers, and so we will push the people that live in that neighborhood out. Well, no one wants to do that, but there's this natural tendency to do it, so all of us in the city need to be cognizant of connecting the dots. Our city's either going to grow this way or that way, and it can't grow that way because of an architect and a... <laughs> ruling, how old is the law? 200 years. 200 years. And whenever I say, can we like reconsider that? No! <laughs> we can't touch it. And, um, and so I always look at other super communities. We have a higher calling in Washington, D.C. We should be the exemplar greatest community in the world. And we have the smartest people, we have the most money, we have the most infrastructure, the most influence, and, and if we can just rally, and if you can't make it um, Athens for the old world, then how can you speak with moral authority for the rest of the world? And we have so much to do here um, the first thing is for us to stop thinking of us as just Washington, D.C., and look at this as the super city. And we've been doing a lot of work with our Greater Washington Partnership to get Virginia and Maryland and D.C. all in one community. Uh, the world's greatest city, greatest economy right now is London. London is basically a city that goes from Baltimore to Middleburg. That's what London is. Uh, many people here worked with us in trying to bring the Olympics here. Um, the reason we were trying to bring the Olympics here, what it did for London. It took a forlorn community and built a low and mid-income housing community. It was there for a couple of months to house the athletes. It's now the most thriving community outside of London. It connected that community through public transportation. It built infrastructure 
from the investment for the media and the television networks. And now it's spawned all of the <coughs> startups in the community. We saw how sports and an event could upgrade that community. And London is a big, big market, 10 million strong. Well, Washington, D.C. is a tiny community. We have 700, 800,000 people. But if you start to bring in Maryland, and anyone that you talk to from Baltimore, and you say, where do you live? I live in Washington. Yeah. You go to New York. Um, I have a friend, they live in Connecticut. He works in Jersey City. Where do you live? New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's going to happen here. Those are the great super cities, these regionalisms. Our birthright was that. There was no Washington, D.C. It was land contributed from Maryland and Virginia. It's a planned community, mostly to be a, a fe our nation's capital, but obviously the people that were brought in to build the nation's capital and work here. And so, so we, we deserve to be a super city. We have a social responsibility to try to make this the exemplar great place to live and work and attract people and companies. And um, we have a lot of work left to do and I have found that if you're rational and reasonable and you can get people to major on the majors, you, you, people can't concentrate and focus on more than two, three, four big things to do. Uh, but if you can center people and organizations around that, that you can make a lot of progress. So for the Hamilton fans in the room, you just kind of describe the room where it happens. <laughs> right? So you've been an elected official and a business leader. Which is easier to be in the room where it happens in that context? Um, well, I started my first company in Vero Beach, Florida, because IBM had started the um, PC division. To get away from corporate, they did it in Boca Raton, Florida. And uh, so I, I started a, a company in Vero Beach on the ocean. And, um, and I ended up becoming mayor of the town of Orchid, Florida. Uh, the one great thing about Florida politics, though, is they have what's called the sunshine laws. Uh, can't do anything without inviting citizens or the media. They can attend. <laughs> every single meeting. And I'm um, a student of history, and that was Thomas Jefferson's um, um, basic tenet on transparency, that you should be able to hold the meeting, you should be able to do a transaction in the town square, and anyone walking by, if they listened in, if they thought it was good to go, and it was cool, nothing untoward was happening, you were okay. And that, that's literally how Florida and the Sunshine Laws happen. Um, I have found, though, that politics is very, very hard to get things done, mostly because you're, you're not really the founder and the owner of something, you're renting the space. And your primary motive is not a higher calling of legacy, if you will, and leaving more than you take. It's re-election. <laughs> and so, so even the best intention politicians um, many times will say, well, I don't want to deal with that now because of fear of what the media or the bloggers might create stir things up, and so there's inaction. And what I tell our employees, what I tell my businesses is um, we and I will be here longer than any president that is in the White House. We will be here longer than any mayor, than any governor, that we have longevity going for us. and that. 
sports teams and big important industries and businesses, you really have much more influence over your community than any transient renter of some, um, some political office. So I, I've come to believe that um, owning sports teams is maybe even more socially responsible um, because um, um, certainly I saw we held the psyche of our community in the palm of our hands when we won the Stanley Cup. Yes. And that, that was a fantastic experience, you know, not, not because we won some hardware. I mean, oh, you, you, you rent the Stanley Cup for one year. We don't have it anymore. It's in the Hall of Fame. Um, but. You, you get some <laughs> rings, you get some rings. And, and someone said to me, well, how much were those rings? And I said, they're like a billion dollars. <laughs> um, but um, but I, I can't tell you, not a day goes by where someone doesn't come up to me and tell me it's winning the cup, going to the parade, being outside Capital One Arena during the, the finals was um, one of the indelible memories they'll have. I, I've honestly had people in their 60s, 70s, 80s come and give me those uncomfortable long hugs <laughs> <laughs> and this notion of I can die in peace that, that I've been so much time and emotion and that higher calling of making that lifelong positive memory and to have conducted ourselves and done in the right way I'm, I'm very very proud of but the great thing about about sports is that you have to get reelected every year, right? You, you, I'm a bum <laughs> if we don't make the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's the most transparent business. It's the one that has the highest of highs and also immediately after the lowest of, of lows. And so it's, a, it's an honor to kind of represent um, the community, uh, but it's also a, um, a very daunting challenge because the demands are very, very high from our, from our community. And um, you know, I'm hoping that we can build teams that the community is proud of and that we can win championships. But more importantly, um, I have 4,000 employees. It's about 15,000 people in our extended family. We pay our taxes. We are a union shop. We um, I'm involved with Steve Case in a venture private equity firm that has a billion and a half dollars that we're investing in local companies. We, we literally are creating another 50,000 jobs to all of the companies that we're involved in. And so I, I think we can make huge economic impact and then we can use that influence to major in the majors. Um, you know, we were very helpful and instrumental in getting Amazon to choose us as one of their headquarters sites. And, and we can argue and opine and pixelate a lot, as we should. Uh, but bringing a company like Amazon, a company like Alibaba, which is coming here for open their cloud business is really good for us. We can, we need, um, we need jobs, we need tax revenues, we need to have the government to be starting to focus on what is their prime initiative. And 
you know, as much as I love disruptors, I, I had to laugh when I heard our congresswoman from Queens say, you know, now that they're not coming, we can take that $3 billion and invest it in things we need. I was like, there's a small detail here. <laughs> there's no $3 billion. Minor, minor issue. So, so we, we can work on the, make sure that the, the things that we do are done in the light of day. You know, there probably was some non-transparency in some of the things that were happening in Europe. We don't have that here. This was a great collective effort between D.C. and Virginia and Washington. Um, this notion of if one wins, we all win. That was our positioning around it. Uh, we now have an executive from Amazon who's serving on our board for Greater Washington Partnership. And a couple of weeks ago, we had a board meeting. And he said, it couldn't have been more different New York versus the DMV. It just could not have been more different than you won, which is why we're doing it, and they lost. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, for those of us, many of us who've met here through uh, our efforts in trying to bring the Olympics, um, we worked together and we lost. And they gave it to Boston, if we remember. Yes. And in the conversation with the people, I said, well, why would you do that? They don't want it, and they don't have the money. <laughs> and they rejected it. And then the group of leaders from the Olympics said they hated Washington, D.C. And they said, why would you hate Washington, D.C.? And they said, um, well, no one around the world likes Washington, D.C. And I said, really? That's what you <laughs> think? <laughs> you're the U.S. O.C. and your belief is that no one likes or respects the United States. And, um, and just madness. And sometimes leaders get bad input. They interpret data the wrong way. Um, there is an organization that desperately needs Washington, D.C., and as I told one of the leaders, you may not want to be here, but you're going to be here a lot now testifying <laughs> on why your organization is so corrupt and morally bankrupt. And <laughs> So like any good interview, you've, you've, uh, there's so many questions I could ask next here. Uh, let's see, where do we want to go? Uh, I, I, I do want to touch on, on the sports. Uh, so for anybody who's familiar at all with your background, they'll know you have a pretty famous bucket list. And number 40 was owning a sports team, and number 41 was winning a championship. Where does that rate, though, in your list of accomplishments, which are pretty long in excess of winning a championship for this city? You know, I gave a, a little talk last night to uh, the Mindshare group, which is startup entrepreneurs, and um, I was telling the power of um, serendipity and taking <coughs> reckonings, and rather than this um, woe is me culture that's happened on embracing reckonings, and a lot of times when you lose, uh, it paves the way to future victory. And um, so if you've read my book, which I, I'm going to try to republish a little bit, um, The Business of Happiness, I, I declared a false victory. I started a company at a young age, and I sold it, and I made a, a lot of money. And you know, when you're an immigrant in immigrant America, it's kind of work real hard, go to a good school, get good grades, get a good job, make some money, full stop. And, um, and then I went to the Library of Congress, took my son, he was in school on a field trip, and, um, and they have in the Library of Congress the Declaration of Independence. 
every draft of it. It's really a fascinating, um, it's really unbelievable what our founding fathers editing like a law firm every line mm -hmm. of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, the only lines that weren't edited were life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Um, pretty interesting, right, that, that they put happiness as a, as, a, um, as a major tenant of why we have democracy. And I had never thought of happiness. Um, and so when I had my little um, reckoning, I got on the wrong airplane, and nothing will clear your mind like a reckoning, right? We all have them, uh, aspirations aren't met, your heart is broken, you have a financial setback, somebody you love dies, you have a health scare, we, we have reckonings. And so I had this reckoning, the plane was going to crash. And um, it's fascinating when you're facing death, all the stuff that you've done and collected, you don't go, oh, I'm going to miss that new BMW. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter. It's experiences and relationships that, that you miss, you'll miss. And so, um, so I, I made this list. I said if I, I started praying, and um, I'm not all that religious, I started laughing because all I could think of was if there was God like tuned in to my station, <laughs> he or she would say, oh, how convenient. <laughs> now we're praying. <laughs> Now we got religion. <laughs> it seemed inauthentic. So I, I tried to cut a deal. A simple deal, right? It's like pitching a movie or something. And it was, uh, let me through, and I, I'll, I, personally, I'll live a life, life without regret, and I'll leave more than I take. Those are the two things that I... I want to be judged on. I made the list, and my first thing I wrote on my list was fall in love and get married, have children. And then it kind of went from there. And so the story I told last night was um, um, like who you marry is, becomes very important, who you associate it with. And, um, and so, like, number 40 was own a sports team, which was a big aspiration, and win a championship. And um, I saw this little company, it was successful, America Online bought it, I moved back to Washington, D.C., and someone approached me to buy the teams. And I, my wife and I had had two children, and they were young and going to school, I wanted to be a, a great dad, I was president of America Online, the company was booming, and when I was approached on the team, I said, no, I passed. I said, um, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of scrutiny, it's a lot of work. I got AOL, 25,000 families, I have my two kids, I, I can't do it. And I went home that night and my wife, uh, t you know, what, what's new, what happened today? And I tell her the story, she said, what did you say? I said, I passed. And I tell her why, and she says, okay, that's, that's reasonable. And, take a shower, laying in bed, and she says to me, um, what if you get 99 of the 101 things done before you die and you don't get the chance to buy the team or win a championship? And um, next day I said, well, that's why I love you. <laughs> and and I, we bought the teams. Now, if I don't marry that woman, we're not together forever, it's, I don't do that. I, I get different advice. And now she did it out of love. It's turned out to be a really big, important business and investment. Um, we'll do $500 million in revenue. Company's probably worth three and a half billion dollars. Um, it was a great economic business decision that, you know, I, I won't benefit, the only benefit from 
the asset value creation when you die, <laughs> right? I mean, not selling the teams, I'll own the teams till I die, and then the community, my family will end up with it. Um, but it was a, a empathy and act of love and really understanding me and it turned out to be a great thing across the board and and so you know owning the teams are incredibly important to me and to my family uh, and it's I think winning championships will be the lazy thing that people reference in my obituary. <laughs> Just a, a lazy way to define you. And so at least I'll, I'll have that first line <laughs> that no one will be able to screw up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it's not the most important thing. I mean, to me, the most important thing is my family and then um, how the, the millions of hopefully positive touch points that we can create. And I'm also not naive to know, you know, I screw up all the time. And, and, but because of my family and because of my mom and dad and the way I was raised, I have confidence that failure's okay. And, and I, I do think that that's something in today's um, world that we live in that we've weaponized shame. We've weaponized um, spewing pixels. And, um, and, and unless you have that confidence at home, um, you know, I read some things sometimes about me. And I go, no, I, you go, is that me? I mean, if it is, I, and, and, and then you realize, no, it's like showbiz, right? I mean, it's, it, it's, um, and so it makes it hard because it's showbiz to take any input from elites because they're, they're really not in the business to help anyone get better. So that's why I have to be with my family, I have to be with our employees, I have to be with, with people because they don't have a ax to grind. They'll, they'll give you kind of unabashed, straightforward information. And you know we need more of that. Um, you can't you can't um, listen to experts. Um, pretty much what I've always tried to do, and I actually imparted this to my son and daughter. I said, well, usually listen and read what experts say, and do just the opposite. <laughs> Um, we, we brought in a speaker the other day um, at Monumental. We probably had 500 people to hear this speaker. And it was, um, it was on unconscious bias and why your brain is wired the way it is. And most of the work and the answers that were given was from a collective. There were a couple where I was an outlier in my, the way I was wired, where I said the opposite. I was counterintuitive. And that's mostly from being an entrepreneur, also having the confidence to say, I, I won't follow the crowd. But the, the most amazing exercise was, put up on our big gigantic screen, just a white screen. And I think the question was something that everyone saying, what color is that? White, what color is that? White, what color is that? White, what color, what, is it milk? Is it the color of milk? Say milk, say milk, say milk. Say cow, say cow, say, 
and he had everyone saying it over and over and over again. And then he said, what does a cow drink? And everyone said milk. <laughs> It was genius. <laughs> it was absolute genius. Who said water? Did you say water? Mm -hmm. I said water too. <laughs> but it was genius that if you get people seeing something and then collectively saying something, mm -hmm. that's the answer. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, th to me, that was like the biggest takeaway to be like really critical and don't listen to what everyone around you was thinking and saying, because they said that with conviction. <laughs> and if you were the person who would have said water out loud, yeah. for that moment, everyone would have said, what? <laughs> <laughs> Cow, milk, what? <laughs> um, so, you know, we need more of that, and it's, it's hard to exercise that because, you know, that, that speech was your brain is just wired to belong. And then it's who you associate with, right? That your, your beliefs, and it's why when we're seeing something on television or hearing some policy, we go, water! And they're saying, milk! And, and we don't get it, right? The, the people that said milk, they felt milk. And the people who said water, which there weren't that many people, <laughs> go, cows don't drink milk. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to open it up uh, to the folks up there. But so you talked there, right? About did we take off the things because they're not sponsors? That <laughs> <laughs> is that what this? Okay, you're going to be. You're still talking to a guy who calls it the Verizon Center. So, <laughs> so, um, so you talked there about. Uh, <laughs> there you go. About about managing talent. And you manage talent in, in your business, your 4,000 sort of monumental employees. And, and then you have this other very specialized talent group in athletes. Um, and you talk about pixelization and how different people sort of show up. What's different about managing the talent in one of your organizations that I'll call just sort of a business and then managing the, the talent of sport, sports athletes? There's this arms race um, with talent, and the and if you can believe it, our our talent is represented by a union, and I, I always laugh at that, right? Because I mean, we have a union for our um, employee base that works in the arena, and they couldn't be more far apart on what their needs are, and and. You know, we have a generation of athletes that are incredibly gifted, but are ending up disconnected from the people that they serve. And, um, you know, on occasion you get an exemplar athlete, um, an Alex Ovechkin, um, Bradley Beal is certainly emerging that way where they are motivated in majoring in the majors. Their families are incredibly important to them. Being great fathers um, is a noble pursuit for them. They know that that's gonna be a job that they'll have much longer than you know, their five, 10, 15 year career. Loyalty really matters to them. Um, you know, Alex Ovechkin is a generationally great player. I met him when he was 19 years old and uh, told him how hard this was going to be, but that we're in it together and that there'd be all sorts of stuff written about him. <coughs> 
people would be mean, um, but that that this community would rent it together and that he could be um, a beloved, respected person and that there was nothing better than spending your whole life and career at one place and being able to look back at your life's work and say, we accomplished something dramatic. I've had the same discussions in a positive way with both John Wall and Bradley Beal. And, and they love Washington, D.C. They get it. Um, Bryce Harper, um, he, he lost himself. He let somebody else guide his decision. Um, not his mom and dad, not his wife. He made a decision to follow the money. $300 million wasn't enough. He wanted to make $330 million. Does that make any sense to you? I mean, do you know Bryce Harper would have owned Washington, D.C.? Uh, he's going to Philadelphia. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm speaking of Philadelphia. Um, so, our super city goes from Richmond to Delaware. I've, I've met with the governor uh, of Delaware, some of the senators I've set up. We, are, we need to acquire formally Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> and New York is Connecticut and New Jersey. And, and Philly ain't a super city. It's like Tyson's Corner. <laughs> That's what Philadelphia is. It has great sports teams and unbelievable fans, but as a community, and so they're going to have to choose one day. Do they want to be part of New York? Or do they want to be part of the DMV? And, um, and so, so with the athletes, um, whenever we've made a mistake, it's because we can't reach or the, the habits of the athlete, it's all about the craft and the money. It's not about the social responsibility of, of being a great athlete and being a great performer and that they haven't bought into that there is a higher calling. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do more and more in our organization is, yes, he's a great player, but is he a great person? Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, John Wall, he's been, he's just had this string of bad luck. He's had his reckoning. I saw John last night and he gave me a hug. John has had a reckoning. He was the first pick in the draft. He was a five-time All-Star. And he's had a series of injuries. He, he will have missed collectively two full seasons. You think about the injury the year before, the injury this year, and what he could be facing next year. His mom is quite ill. He just had his first child. And that's a lot to deal with. And, and the community should be here to pick him up. We will work with him. And my bet is that he will use this reckoning to come back. And John wants to be here. And that's, that's why I love John Wall. Bradley Beal, read his quotes. I want to be here my whole career. He's a fantastic human being. Boy, he's a great player. Um, Nick Backstrom wanted to be, and these are Hall of Fame players in Nick Backstrom and Alex Ovechkin. And so we, we want to have players that can be reflective on our community. Obviously, they need to get results. They also need to get through this era of players, and our commissioner, Adam Silver, addressed this the other day. We've never had a generation of player nor a politician that's had to live through social media. Um, and, and our commissioner was talking about 
our players seem melancholy, and, and many of them do, who aren't grounded in an organization or with family um, where they have that confidence. Because if you're listening to social media, and we've grown up to respect how important media is, when someone anonymously is tweeting, they got to be important because it's media. And, and it's so easy, these young men and women have hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions of followers. And you can leave comments. And, and many of these players are not happy. They're, they're defensive. They want to be in that bubble because they read the comments and they think it's reflective of society at large. As opposed to, no, it's like a letter to the editor, right? And it's like 1% of 1% will write the letter. And, and so there's this miasma that's been created and it's up to ownership um, to be able to cut through that noise and try to focus on signal, on what matters, what's important, uh, what your true net worth is, and how will you declare victory? The, the, the unbelievable thing about sports is it is totally, totally binary. Um, we were considered, the Washington Capitals, the biggest losers in the NHL. Alex Ovechkin was considered the world's best player who had never won a championship. Um, not, well, we had the best collective regular season record over the last decade. We sold out every game. We built a billion dollar asset. We've employed all of these people. We bought great choice. Like, no, it's binary. <laughs> Written by people who've never won anything. <laughs> and, and, um, and I, I saw this actually this morning. Uh, we, we had won three president's trophies. You get a trophy for having the best record during the regular season. It's like a curse word. It would be solved, yeah, president's trophy winner. <laughs> and you, you get these trophies and you hide them. <laughs> It was a curse. No one wants to win the president's trophy. Um, very binary. One winner, 30 losers last year. And then we won the Stanley Cup. Now it sounds good. Well, they won three president's trophy in a Stanley Cup. <laughs> <laughs> now it's like... I got the president's trophies out now. <laughs> and, and so so media, social media sometimes define under standards that I don't know how the memo goes out and who's a winner, who's a, a loser, uh, but now we have that clarity and finality with the caps. We want to win it again now. Now we want to try and repeat. Um, we have work to do with the Wizards. I, I get that. And I'm very dedicated. I'll spend as much money as we can. I'll work as hard as we can. We'll get it right. That's my belief. The Washington Mystics, which I need everyone's support on. Um, we went to the finals last year. I think we can win a champion. We, we have to start every year with the goal of all our teams are going to make the playoffs so all our teams can compete for championships. That's what our community deserves. And when you don't, you're one of the losers. Um, and, and so it's the ultimate binary business, if you will. You keep score every day, every moment. Yesterday, the Wizards played a game. We had a 15-point lead. And then at the end of the first half, we, the lead 
diminished and um, and we um, we were down by a point and I was walking to go have dinner at halftime and you knew this was going to happen and this guy runs down and he goes, hey, sell the team! <laughs> <laughs> right? The derivative, <laughs> waiting to see what I would would say and respond, I'm sure his buddy was going to tape it or do something. Uh, yeah. And I said, thank you for coming. Let's see what happens in the second half. And, uh, I mean, it's just the kind of world we live in. But, but it, you go from cheers to jeers very, very quickly. And, but I get the joke that uh, wizards are not performing the way we want. And, uh, but I, I don't want anyone to think that our competitiveness, our commitment, we want Washington, D.C. to be number one greatest city and community in the world. I want to play a part in that. We want our teams to compete and win championships in everything that we approach. And I say majoring in the majors, we want to be the best at. And, but when you try to accomplish that, you're going to fail more times than you succeed. And so if you're afraid of failure, I think one of our presidents said, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, well, <laughs> there's a lot of cooking going on <laughs> in, in my world, and I, I know I'm just going to fail a lot more than I succeed and I very much appreciate friends and people in the community that go, that's all right, it's not that big of a failure. Try again next next year. And I have no intention of ever selling the teams. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right, we're gonna take questions. We got one over here. Mike's coming right behind you. Uh, Donald Dunn from Georgetown University Medical Center. Hey Donald, will you stand up? Good morning, I'm Donald Dunn from Georgetown University Medical Center. Today the, uh, the web is 30 years old. Imagining how the web changed our lives over the last 30 years with media, with the economy, what do you think it might look like 30 years from now and the impact that it might give us? Um, you know, I'd like to take credit. I mean, I was kind of there when the web was created. Um, um, Netscape opened the web, but AOL built a private internet. We had to do that because the government really built the internet, and it was illegal to hack into the internet. And, um, and the browser first came about, Netscape. Um, we acquired Netscape. Netscape reported to me, if you look in the history of the web wars and being able to commercialize the web, um, there's something called Mozilla, which is the free and popular. And um, I allowed the code that we had ended up paying about $10 billion for to go out to the people and opened it up. and. AOL made a financial philanthropy contribution to allow that organization to exist, Mozilla.org. And, um, and we kind of invented the notion of community. We invented messaging. We created AIM, um, instant messaging. And I would celebrate community and social media I mean, not to be immodest on this, but if you type in who first said the term social media, that would be me. <laughs> um, I don't like to admit it anymore because <laughs> of how badly it's been interpreted. But it's just about scale. There are 7 billion people on the planet. There's 5 billion people that have connected to the internet. <coughs> Um, because I'm a, a positive person, um, 30 years ago uh, when the web was opened, um, I said, today is the worst day the web will ever be. Um, that there'll be 
more investment dollars pouring in, there'll be more people coming onto the web, there'll be uh, more voices, there'll be more uh, creative utilization by industries and science and education, and so it's the worst that it'll ever be. Um, but because of the scale, um, and you know, I, when you mentioned I was mayor of my town when I came to AOL and became president, I said, this is the world's fastest growing city. And I'm really mayor of a community. Um, and I have to worry about all of the things that a mayor has to worry about. Crime, infrastructure, social good, um, entertainment, commerce. I mean, it's no different if you're running a big web service that you're really running a big economy and and at the time we had 300 million citizens at our peak and now these next generation social media companies have a billion people in their community and and so so in a lot of these people that created these companies they don't have any experience they haven't done anything but what they're running and so Today, the web is having its reckoning. Um, I think that you know what Mark Zuckerberg talked about last week. Um, I had to say, kudos, terrific, but like, what took you so long? Um, you know, at AOL, we wrote the first terms of service. We had to deal with the bad actors when I was. I went to a mayor, my first mayor's conference. I think the mayor of New York spoke. I think it was David Dinkins was the mayor at the time. So I have 8 million people in my city. And 10% of them have bad thoughts every day. So I worry about the 800,000 people that are having bad thoughts. And 10% of them, 80,000, have bad intentions and have done something. They haven't paid their taxes, they've shoplifted, they've jaywalked, they've, they've done something bad. And 10% of them are criminals. And 10% of that criminal population are murderers and rapists and arsonists. That's why I need to have a lot of policemen. I have to protect all those other people from those bad people. And what do the newspapers focus on? Those bad people. They don't want to write about um, Joe and Mary got up this morning and <laughs> went to work and dropped their kids off at school. I mean, that, that won't sell media. That won't make headlines and listicles. And, um, and so we've ended up in this world where it's the fringe and where we have to focus on that small percent of the smallest percent. Um, so where do I see the web being um, next? Um, it's what's called, in Steve Case, my friend, partner, um, wrote a really interesting book on the third wave, which is uh, the internet now will be atmospheric on other industries. So you work at the hospital. Um, healthcare will be the, um, the biggest um, recipient of change for the benefit of consumers. Um, I'll give you a great example. Also create great wealth. Um, I'm an investor and on the board of a company called Tempus, T-E-M-P-U-S, which is a big data uh, company that takes uh, data, census data from people that have a disease state plus molecular data and brings it together for the benefit of a, of a patient 
and it was born out of the personal experience of a very close friend of mine who I had invested in several of his other companies, and his wife had breast cancer. And he had the means to say to me, um, will you help me with this company? I'm gonna take as much time off as I need to be with my wife, and we're gonna go everywhere, we're gonna beat this. Um, and he was appalled at going to the greatest places for cancer, for breast cancer, and when it was the penultimate question, if she was your wife, your family member, what would you do? What treatment would you give? And they, he'd get answers like, well, you know, I think four years ago, one of my partners kind of had a case like this. I'll drop him a text and find out what he would say. Or, you know, I think three years ago, there was a New England Journal of Medicine. There was a trial with like 15 people in the trial. And it's like, really? So I can plan my Hawaiian family vacation with more precision and more data and more information, more crowdsourced info then I can, what treatment should my wife with stage three breast cancer take? Mm -hmm. And so, so we're seeing dramatic, dramatic advances because of the web, because of computing power, because of big data. And basically what Tempest has done is to be able to bring in all of that data so that with precision, someone can say, oh, my wife is Russian. Here's what her genome says. Here's what her mom and dad, here's the village that she grew up in. This is how tall she is. This is how much she weighs. Uh, this is the stage of cancer. Here's everything about that. Here's all of the treatments that have been given through all of these centers over the last X years, and I just want to be able to say that this medicine with this treatment has had an output of this many high quality years. That's all I want as the answer. And the doctors want that too. Mm -hmm. The doctors don't want to have random, <laughs> if, you, you know, if you think about it, it's the most important decision. And we still look at doctors like they're the high priests, and they're going to tell you, well, this is, this is where you should be going on vacation. And this is the room that you should, the travel agents, they should be able to tell you like real data based. Um, and, and so what, what I see is that the next generation of web should have an incredible amount of positive um, outcomes in those categories. I also think that that education, which the system, like Lot and Font, and we can't have tall buildings in DC because we want it to be like Paris, the city of light. So, well, it's still be a city of light. It could be pretty good. <laughs> You'll use the air rights. Um, it'll transform because the worst payback we have in any industry is higher education. That, that we do not get any return and so using the web and the internet to augment and be able to have accountability and have trained people for the new economy, I think that the web will unlock a lot of that. Hi, speaking of higher education and question of payback, I'm Maury Piper from George Mason. I, I really enjoyed your comments, and I want to point the three things and then ask your opinion on something. Um, first of all, you pointed out unconscious bias that we have. One of those fundamental unconscious biases is who's part of my group and who isn't. Right? In group, out group, I care about these people, I don't care about those people. Everybody does it, we don't know that we're doing it. Um, the second is, what's a great super city? 
and what does it mean to be part of a super city and how does a great one work? You mentioned London, where I lived for 18 years and watched it kind of meander a bit, but by and large, for centuries, it's been one big city. And you just mentioned Paris, much harder. And if you look at the global economy and their effect, London is more effective because it's more together. Paris is less effective because it's more dispersed. Now, coming to Washington then, and the third thing is what you said about change. Can we change a 200-year-old law, for example? Well, I was born here, I was away for 30 years, I got back a year and a half ago, and I'm scratching my head, what's Washington? You said, well, we could maybe adopt Delaware. Okay, that might be nice, Philadelphia might argue with you. <laughs> but what about the difference now between D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, where I now live and work, having grown up in Maryland, I don't see that us fully as the super city you're going for because there's Richmond, there's the rest of the state, that a lot of the country faces these divisions. So my question is, what else would you change to get us to that super city to be as competitive as, as we could? Um, well, it's not what I'm going for. I think <laughs> it's, it's something that is, um, is endemic to um, the 10 million people that are, are living here. They're, Whenever we have tried to bring something big and important um, to the community at large, there's been alignment because it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So you talked about um, France and England, and they had a very, very big endeavor. They made the channel, and, and they had to have a team of people working together, but they agreed, we will dig this way, you will dig this way, and we will meet here. There wasn't a lot of value added on, well, you know, the French, we like our roads to go like this. They, they agreed to major on the majors. We couldn't get Maryland and Virginia to do that. After 2008, there was these huge stimulus dollars. Virginia took the money and said, well, we'll make this silver line and try to connect our two airports. By the way, three international airports are a hallmark of a super city. Eight major research institutions or more are a hallmark of a super city. So Johns Hopkins, and University of Richmond all have participated in our Greater Washington Partnership Initiative. In fact, we held a meeting of presidents and held, attended. It was the first time that all of the university presidents, I mean, it was amazing. They came into the room and they were shaking hands for the first time. <laughs> now, why is that? Oh, by the way, by bringing them all together, we said, there's a big thing happening, Amazon. Now, Amazon wants to come here because of talent. Students are really unhappy with their educational output. Junior year, they start going, why am I a sociology major? <laughs> what, what's that going to get me? And so, we worked with business, we worked with <coughs> the presidents of these universities, we worked with Amazon, and we said, is there a way that we can have one program, a certificate, and then an advanced certificate that you can take at every one of these universities, regardless, you know, if you go to Georgetown and you take the problem of God and you're a liberal arts major or you go to University of Maryland and you're in the School of Engineering, is there a program that you can take that would give business the confidence that when I've taken this program, I got an A in all my Shakespeare and art history classes, but I also passed in cloud architecture. <coughs> And that if Amazon's coming in and they're going to have to hire 25,000 people over time and they don't want it, we don't want it to be a net zero that, oh yeah, they got 25,000 people over time from Boeing and from, right. from all of our businesses that the tide rose. So we brought that together. 
Virginia and Maryland, when they got all this money after 2008 and 9, Virginia invested in roads and rail, and they built this much bigger road system, and then Maryland used the money on inner roads and didn't do anything on the bridge. And so you go, we have more traffic. The whole idea was uplift the quality of life. We have the worst commuter traffic in the country. Worse than LA, worse than New York, worse than Chicago, the other three super cities. Think about that. We had $20 billion or so that was gifted for infrastructure, for, for roads, for bridges, and it wasn't done in continuity and in a coordinated way. And so, so when we you get a new governor, you get a new governor, you have a mayor, and you go, it doesn't make any sense, right? So let's find a way to bring all of that together. Our little group, it's been easy to work on mobility, which is we need more mobility. We need roads. We need buses. We need trains. Businesses are demanding it. The schools are demanding it. And so, so that's what I mean by majoring in the majors. You can fight over anything you want, but how about we make the tunnels underground meet so that we can have a train? And we have a tunnel in Maryland that was built during the Civil War. The Northeast Corridor is the most important economic engine in the country, maybe the world. Does it make any sense for someone to say, well, let's really, well, let someone else worry about that? You talk to people in Baltimore, and they want to be like Tyson's Corner. They want people to live in D.C. and commute to Baltimore. They want people to live in Baltimore and commute to D.C. That's London. Right. And so, so we have to major in those majors and try to find that higher calling, which is connectivity and mobility. You mentioned Verizon. I'm mad at Verizon. Um, and, and I just read an article the other day about 5G, and we need 5G in our community. Uh, we need 5G in Ward 8. Okay. We should demand hold people's feet to the fire, that is, they're rolling out new technology infrastructure, that it be it's like <coughs> clean running water for all. Can you imagine, you say, you know, we're going to have clean reservoirs and water here, this side of the Anacostia, but you know, those people over there, we'll, we'll just, when we're never out there. There's no restaurants there, so we don't have to be, so, so whether they can have dirty water. Really? Well, that's what we've kind of done in technology rollouts, and so, so I think 5G should be a clearing call, and we all should hold Comcast and, and Verizon and all of the providers with if you want access to all of the money, all of the power, all of the influence in Washington, D.C., you've got to roll this out at the same time so that everyone has that equal access. And, and those, that's what I mean by majoring in the majors. See, I saw everyone kind of not. Is there anyone who doesn't think everyone should have 5G for all? <laughs> right? I mean, everyone nods their head. But watch how hard it's going to be to either morally legislate that or politically legislate that. It, it makes infinite sense. And you know, I'm hoping that we can have that influence on not a million things, but on a few big things like that, that we can, we can end up looking back as a legacy and say, geez, we gave high-speed access 
to everyone and look at look at the great companies that were launched in Ward 8. Look at uh, the people who went to college on uh, the scholarship programs that we created and came back into the city and now they're not first generation college kids. They it's going to college and coming back into the community and and finding you know, employment and paying taxes and we can show a virtuous cycle and I think that that's uh, all on us. You can't say it's on me, it's on everyone. And I've, I've always felt that we're in it together. Last question. Yeah, on yeah you've been so gracious with your time. One more question. Can we hang on to this mic for a few minutes? Um, good morning, Michelle Tackle. I'm the executive director for City Year DC. And um, you talked about a virtuous cycle just now, talked about your own story and the kindness of others along the way. And just curious, I get a chance to give young people advice that they sometimes take, I think so. But um, I would love to hear what advice you have for young people who are um, for a year imparting that kindness on others, and then also young people who are starting off their career um, in this new economy, in this new world, and what uh, wisdom I can bring up. Um, when, when I'm a baby boomer, and television was the narcotic for my generation. And um, the TVs were turned on eight hours a day um, in most homes. And both my mom and dad had to work. And just for whatever reason, I remember one television in our entire home. And my mom and dad basically had me focus on being a good student and reading. And that lifelong, um, I, I read voracious. I read more than anybody in our company. I, I know that for a fact. I read five newspapers a day. I read like 20 magazines a week. I have two books. Every, I read, I read, I read, I read. And I read every word, and I circle things, I send, magazines with little yellow stickies that people in the company all the time. Read, 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 read. Don't watch television. And, and I don't watch television because it's an archive. My advice is put the phones away. And I helped to create it. And, but put the weapon we away. And, and have more experiences and talk to people. It's amazing when you get out. I mean, I, I walk around the arena every day, every game. Uh, I don't do it because I'm a nice guy. It's how, how I learn stuff, how I see stuff, how I experience stuff. And, and so my my biggest advice is that if you think the narcotic was television, eight hours a day, I, mean, I, I remember working on a white paper, the always on consumer. <laughs> like that was a good thing, blame me. <laughs> right? we, we want you to always be connected. And um, I try now, I go out to dinner with my Wife with my family, I leave the phone at home. Unless there's a Capsule Wizards game on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, the advice would be less digital, more experience. And, um, and also, those friends on Facebook, they're really not your friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those followers on Twitter, they're really not following. <laughs> And so you have to, to thine own self, be true. And the only way that you can create and build your own identity, your own point of view, is to experience it. And you can't do that by following anonymous people in your, your digital community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.